let's jump into our opening session. Now, with an event that includes innovations in the title, you probably had no doubt the technology would factor into it. Plus, if you're in the CX space, you know about all the exciting technology that's been emerging in our industry. But whenever you have that much innovation and that much hype around technology, there's always the risk that you're going to chase features over outcomes. You're going to invest in these shiny new toys because you saw some great marketing or you heard some buzz or you know your competitors are using them, but you forget to consider how well it actually satisfies the needs of your customers and the needs and goals of your employees. In the best case, what happens is these tools you select don't add the value they should. And in the worst case, and sadly, in an all too common case, they actually make things worse. But it doesn't have to be that way. By rooting your technology in the voice and will of the customer, and then collaborating with all your key internal stakeholders, all your external partners, you can let technology do what it is supposed to do. Be an asset, be a strength on your pathway to a better customer experience. Now, today we're joined by one of the world's most famous brands, an organization that literally proves the customer-facing value of technology on a daily basis. We also have a leading provider in the space that partners with many companies across many different industries to optimize their customer experience framework. So again, it is time for session one. To kick off, I want to introduce our first speaker. So we have Saki here from Netflix. Netflix, of course, is that famous brand that I referenced, certainly doing some amazing things at that fusion of technology and customer experience. So Saki, how is everything? Great. Thank you for having me today, Brian. Definitely. And I also referenced a, a thought leader, expert advisor that works with many different brands. And Julie from Ibex fits that bill. So Julie, how's everything on your end? And why are you excited to really kick off this discussion about the role of technology and partnerships in the CX? I'm doing great, Brian. Thank you. Well, man, you've gotten me so excited to talk <laughs> about this. So, um, you know, there's just so many different advancements in technology that are leading to a better customer experience. So looking forward to uh, having this conversation today. Absolutely. And looking forward to having both of your perspectives here and really making the most of this opening session. So I want to start with you, Saki, with a question that kind of ties directly to my intro, which is that technology can be very valuable, but we have to remember it's a means, not an end. You don't win any awards just because you installed a cool piece of technology. You win customer loyalty when you use your technology to create better experiences. And we can't do that if we don't know what our customers are looking for. So I want to give you the chance right now to uh, talk about how you feel and what you've seen the customer experience landscape evolving and what are some key trends and mindsets we need to know that might inform the way we think about our technology investments. Yeah, of course. So I think now is very exciting time for any CX professional to be in the industry because many CX technologies are evolving to mature and the focus and demand for the great customer experience is higher than ever. Historically, customer service is seen as a cost center and very transactional, but this concept has been changing rapidly over the past several years. Many leading companies and CS organizations are uh, realizing that shift and investing in learning more about their customers through frameworks like customer insights, customer segmentation, customer journey mapping, and persona development, and so on. So this mindset shift of being more um, experiential and recognizing the value enhancing opportunities that we have through CX is one of the key trends. So how does this trend inform the way we think about technology investment? First, I think many organizations are still operating on legacy systems that weren't built for this uh, digital first and customer first vision. So the common challenge is how to lead this digital transformation across the company. And it's really important for any CS leaderships and above to recognizing that investing in the right technology and partnerships that enables you to make the shift are the key to your transformational success. So Saki, I think you are spot on. And Brian, to your comment, you know, we're not getting any better with the customer experience, we're getting worse. And I know the customer has increasingly become more expectant of a highly customized interaction. I know I have. So as a consumer, I'm definitely 
you know, in that camp as well. Um, and I think many companies, to your point, Saki, are looking at serving those customers in a very one size transactional manner. So we hear all the time because we work with many different companies that the importance of personalized high touch interactions have become really the new foundation for success for an effective you know, customer experience strategy. Um, and you also have digitally native customers that really want the option to connect with companies in a very different way. Um, and many companies are operating off of those legacy systems that traditionally just don't put the customer first. Um, and so I think using technology as an enabler is really the mind shift change that needs to happen in order to transform the customer experience. So you mentioned customer mapping and journey mapping, Saki. So that's a, that's a topic I'm very passionate about. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later in our uh, conversation here. And we definitely are. It's almost like Julie knows what's on the agenda for today's discussion, but no, for sure. But before we get there, I do want to bring up, I think you both made a great point, which is we have to think, look at what technology for what it really is. A lot of times you think of technology as the opposite of humanity. And therefore you say, well, as we become more tech focused, we don't need to be as personalized or, or customer centric or emotion driven. And reality is the furthest thing from the truth. Part of technology's value in the business world is it's giving us access to so much more about who our customers are and letting us build experiences on their terms. And those are expectations that customers are not ignoring or not taking lightly. They're very aware of this. They have great user experiences with products they use in their everyday lives. And when they look at a customer service operation, they fully expect the technology is going to play that role as well. So an important standard here is to make sure that you're using technology, one, to get closer to your customers, and two, to build experiences that are more directly designed for who they are, what their intentions are, and what outcomes they ultimately want to have. And if you're not using technology for that purpose, what's going to happen is you're going to have an experience that is not sufficiently personalized, not sufficiently customer-centric, and then to the point we've all been making, that's where you get the stats that show that experiences are not improving. And now one area that actually makes things worse and makes things more challenging is that not only is technology meant to bring us closer to our customers, but it above all from day one, you go back to like the industrial revolution, right? Technology is always supposed to be about making things more efficient and making them more simple and convenient. And yet we often find that in our space, technology that is actually adding complexity and adding new sources of effort and new pain points for customers. So Saki, I want to give you the chance to hear to make some recommendations for how can we avoid this pitfall and ensure that the technology we're using allows us to better understand and more importantly, create better customer journeys. Right. A lot of people seem to think that cutting edge technology and tools will solve your issues, right? But my, my response to it is, um, um, is that technology itself isn't your ultimate solution if your operations, workflows, or processes, or even products are complicated, your system will become complex and will end up with uh, many customization, which in the end becomes your tech debt over time that will slow your business down. So that's the common pitfall. And how do we mitigate such? Again, it's a misconception that technology is your ultimate solution. And before you dive into technology, it's very, very important to understand first uh, who your customers are, and second, uh, what experience of theirs you want to drive towers as a CX organization. So investments in customer and agent journey mapping, for example, it's something I strongly recommend to adapt as uh, one of the data points to drive your strategy. Also, these insights will inform you with the areas to simplify or change in order for you to achieve the customer experience you seek to uh, provide. So you must know what problems you are solving for and then dissect that to a capability level, which will give you a better idea on what is the right technology you need to adapt in priority order. Yeah, Saki. So I love this topic, and Brian, as I as I just mentioned it, and you know, I get a front row seat at seeing what so many companies do because we are a service provider, as you said earlier, Brian. So I've seen many examples where companies layer on so much technology that the simplicity and the elegance of the solution is just completely lost. Right. So instead of deploying technology that does things like lower the handle time or eliminate repeat calls, it does just the opposite. And you end up creating a poor process 
for the customer service agent to begin with, and then a bad experience for the end customer. So on the point of understanding the customer, I want to drill into that a little bit. I do agree on the investment of journey mapping and creating that map is really, really important as it's really that visual story of your customer's interactions with your brand. And it enables the company to step into the customer's shoes and see their business from that perspective. In essence, it's kind of what you're asking your customer to go through in order to get their problem solved. And so, and there's that, that side of the mapping is the customer side. The other side of the mapping is the frontline agent experience. So I'll give you an example. We have created something we call VOC talks and it kind of has a play on TED talks. And so it highlights not only the customer journey, but also that frontline journey. And where we often find a lot of friction is right there, right? Between what the agent is empowered to do or not do and what the customer is trying to solve. And so in many cases, um, we see a very poor customer experience come out of the fact that just the processes are not set up correctly in order to deliver on um, solving an issue. So I would say that avoiding technology pitfall, one way to avoid the technology pitfalls to one, to you, like you said, Saki, know who your customer is, you know, know who they are, how they want to engage with you and what processes you have in place that are contributing to a good or bad experience and understanding those are gonna able to uh, enable you to pinpoint that technology required to, to deliver the overall best experience. Yeah, and I think really, again, starting with your journey and starting with customer intentions and then building the right technology around that, that of course is a great framework, but it sounds great and it's we know it's not easy. One, because we know that organizations internally can be so misaligned. And if you don't have everyone moving on the same direction, it's gonna be hard to get the right technology framework in place. But there's also another potential complication. That's the fact that there's virtually no customer facing organization out there that exists entirely in a vacuum. They rely on partners to bring their strategy to fruition, people who are outside their business, who sometimes may be working with many other different companies. And so having the right partner, one who despite all that can really align with who, what you're trying to be and really keenly be aware of what your journey needs to look like for your customers, that's going to be extremely important. And unfortunately, not every company is successful at identifying those partners, but some are. And Saki, I know that you have some great guidance on what it takes to identify and then manage the best possible CX partnerships. Yeah, uh, you are so right, Brian, about this partnership. And partnership is really one of the exciting uh, topic that I want to talk about. So to me, two most important things I look for when selecting partnerships are one, our value alignment, and then the second is the passion for a true partnership buildings that makes us to do things better. Um, it takes two parties to make a true partnerships works, you know, it's not just one sided. And so being transparent with sharing your trusted uh, partner, key information like your values, strategies, challenges, or even visions are very important in my opinion. And we have been building a true partnership with IBEX over the years. IBEX is one of our trusted partners who is proactive in offering their expertise and exploring solutions together in a way that is not just for the sake of them, you know, selling a solution to us or anything. So one example is that uh, Julie and I were in the meeting together the other day to go over some joint projects and her team has shown not only a value added approach, but also is comfortable enough to, in our partnership to hold Netflix accountable and be honest about sharing some of the areas they think Netflix can improve. And that's the type of truth partnerships I'm looking for. Yeah, so Saki, I think the elements that you include for a valuable partnership are extremely important, particularly transparency. And, um, you know, that's key, in my opinion, to extracting the optimum value for both parties. Um, having a shared vision for success, I think, is also very important. Um, I've seen some very successful partnerships over the years, 
And the, one of the most common denominators is a shared vision of what's possible from both parties. So Saki mentions that we were in a meeting the other day talking about joint projects. And that doesn't mean we're always going to agree on the approach to, you know, go down initially. And it's, uh, but you know what, we come together as partners and we work together as partners. And in the end, we have some really good results. And Ibex and Netflix have been partners now for almost five years. So that's very exciting to us. Um, and we been able to jointly provide some high value to the Netflix customer by engaging in some key areas that we both felt would be, you know, would have big returns for the customer. So um, to Saki's point, we believe that our responsibility really is to bring that innovation as a partner to the table. It's kind of beyond the basic contract, right? We are, you know, one of our jobs is to bring that innovation. So in the case of Netflix, we brought our business intelligence and analytics team to the table to drive some very strong improvements in areas like um, repeat calls and customer sad, et cetera. So um, we believe that a lot of those areas that we're working jointly on um, in the end has improved the customer experience overall for Netflix. Yeah, and I love, Joy, that you said that it's not always about just agreeing on the specific tactics, but it's about agreeing on the overall outcomes. And that's where great partnerships come from. And what I would add here is that I think there's three things you need to be aligned on. So one is the what. Ultimately, there has to be a shared sense of what are we trying to achieve? What does a great customer experience look like? What result do we want? But perhaps even more important than the what is the why, because if you don't understand why this matters to the business, that's where you're going to have some misalignment. You may have a partner that says, well, I can achieve this by cutting a bunch of costs. But if the business doesn't want to risk the potential negative impact of cutting costs, that could be a problem too as well. So having a sense of why that outcome matters is a great way to align everyone. And then particularly important now, at a time when we know that especially on the agent side, when you have an interaction with an employee, it needs to be as personalized and human and reflective of the brand as possible. Alignment over who is so important. If you don't have shared values about who you are as a company and clear transparency over what it means to represent that brand, then you're not going to have an effective interaction. You're not going to be a great ambassador for them. But when you can align over those three areas, that's when the partnership is going to be as effective as possible. And it certainly sounds like Netflix and Ibex are aligned on those, if not many more other categories, leading to, to great success and great, uh, great interactions and, of course, great growth over time. Speaking of great growth over time, so you know, you've all heard the adage, when it rains, it pours. And we know that's certainly true when it comes to the customer experience landscape. Not only are we dealing with so many different changes from employees working in different environments to customers interacting in new channels, but they're also their demands are increasing. We're seeing that employees and customers, for that matter, are more emphatic in looking for faster, frictionless, yet also highly empathetic and personalized experience as well. And so we have a, our work cut out for us for sure. We have to scale, but we have to improve at the same time. So Saki, how can technology make that happen? Right, I, right use of technology can give you scalability in CS operations for sure. And in return, you gain the time you need to invest in improving your customer experience. Whether that is through data collection and analytics or deep dive into your customer journey mapping, it's important that you leverage the data and insights to back up your assumptions and take an iterative approach to continue improving the customer first uh, approach to CS. As mentioned earlier, the customer journey mapping is insightful in many ways. And I recommend establishing um, both customer and support agent effort scores, as well as the measurement of the impact that such scores have over brand and product loyalty. There are many technologies or solutions that help you map out customer journeys and also provide you a 360 degree view of customer information. It will be a well worth of an investment to build out or purchase dashboards capabilities that give you the data insights you need and ultimately show the stories you are looking to tell. Now, Julie, what other uh, data would you say that plays a big role here? Well, okay, so I'd like to drill down on this one a little bit. So I agree with understanding the agent effort and customer effort are super important. Um, and Brian, you know, um, you, you, your, your beginning of this question was really interesting to me because data, you know, plays such a key role in everything. But one of the things that we found that data, the data that really helps identify friction in the journey is volatility. 
right? So understanding how much variation exists in a process points to, you know, what we found really one of two things. First of all, either the process is way too complex and we as consumers have had to go through this very thing ourselves as, you know, being consumers of certain products. So there's either too many steps, there's too many systems um, to follow. So what happens is that whole process is very inconsistent, which means you're going to get an inconsistent outcome, right? So some customers, by luck of the draw, may have a better experience than others, but more, more than likely, it's not going to be a very good one. Or we found that there are silos or misalignment across channels in that experience, um, and that should just be handled completely differently. So if you think about customers are more demanding, right? Um, and therefore you wanna match their level of effort and the outcome that they're looking for. So I think where technology plays a part in this is really fairly easy. If you think about a customer's need and kind of a lower effort and lower volatility in those transactions, I think those processes are ripe for automation. So you could put um, you know, AI for chat bots and things like that, because those are lower effort transactions. And I'm sure those customers would appreciate having that channel. If the particular process is more, you know, the effort is higher um, and it's more complex, then a customer may want more of a voice connection, right? You may need a more concierge type level. Um, so it really depends on looking at that volatility in that entire process and really examining that data very quickly um, and very specifically. So we're consistently engaging our um, clients like Netflix and we're looking to optimize and reassess. So we track closely what the customer responds to um, what kind of AI outreach shows a better CSAT, higher retention, et cetera. So knowing what's working and what isn't um, is, con is super important, and we're constantly evolving that. So that's just one idea of how we use data, but I think it's a really important one as it, as it relates to customer mapping and, and, um, and looking at the customer complexity across that journey. Right, so right. And then I'm also want to add, um, I'm a big fan of the data driven approach. And I've seen, like Julie mentioned, like many CS organizations struggle with finding and owning the source of truth metrics. Um, so having a data science engineering team as your close partner is very important in my experience. Absolutely. I think data without context is, is like having no data at all in this case. You have to have unified data throughout the organization, as well as all your partners, but also a sense of what it really means for the customer experience as well, because we're looking to take actions. We're not looking just to score things. And I, I'm probably going to contradict that in a second by asking about scores and all that. But, but I think having the why and the root causes behind everything, making sure that all the key stakeholders have clear access to what it is, what it means, and how they can make improvement, having the framework for that before you even think about where technology fits in is going to be so valuable for making sure that we are first and foremost building an experience for our customers, for our employees, for our business, and then deciding tactically, technology-wise, what best practices do we want to do to actually bring that to fruition. So I think that combination of valuing data first and foremost, deciding what data is important, and then making sure that everyone is unified through the use of a great data-focused team on what insights matter and what needs to be accessible to everyone, that's going to be the key to success. Now, like I said, I was about to contradict myself by saying we only want to focus on the why because the truth is scores do matter. And that's nothing we can, we can't avoid that. Technology costs money. And if you're not showing the results of your contact center investments, if you're not showing a favorable impact on some key operational KPIs, then you're going to lose the trust of your budget holders. And frankly, it's probably indicative of a poor experience for either your employees and your customers as well. So Saki, I know that you maybe can't share the specific scores that you have at Netflix, but I'm, I'm hoping you might be able to share some insights into what KPIs you do see as crucial and perhaps at the high level, what wins you've been able to achieve by virtue of having great technology and a great partnership. Yes. Um, so I want to start by saying, you know, it's been the common norm for many executives to think of customer service as, you know, throwing money and bodies into the problem and therefore focusing on OPEX, the operational excellence and cost reduction, right? But now the industry is shifting for sure from focusing operational quality to service quality. So while it's important for us to measure operational performance because you know, we have to run the day-to-day -day operations. So we are not 
not focusing that of course we already established that well enough right but it's getting more and more uh, crucial for us to establish right kpis for um kind of help us to move our needle towards service excellence and value realization because those are the crucial kpis that ties your cx operations effort to your core business therefore you would be able to show an roi in your technology investments well, so Julie, forgive this for not being the most delicate question, but you're also an investment for many people out there, your company. And so you're very aware of what results they need to see in order to feel like they're getting their value. So I'd imagine you have a pretty valuable take on the key KPIs as well. Absolutely. And uh, Brian, I was just thinking earlier, we're going to have the t-shirt made up. Don't lose the trust of your budget holders. That was great. Um, but you know what, you know, KPIs are an interesting because it, a lot of times when we enter into an agreement with a client, they will say, this is where we are. This is where we want to be. And we always start with the conversation of, you know, what's the value of the difference, right? Of being here and wanting to go here. So, you know, it's a hot topic for sure. I will say that what we generally start with and the clients really, you know, we, we move into a conversation of is how do we get to the path of proficiency that's the fastest and the most effective, right? And so how do you measure what KPIs are important when you do that? So if you start with that mindset, then you ultimately can determine and back in to the KPIs that are most important to measure. So it may not always be the traditional KPIs, that we've measured in this industry, like speed to answer, handle times, et cetera. Um, in fact, we're seeing more clients change their mindset completely to more customer focused KPIs. So if you're a new customer, for example, there are no average handle time, right? There is no average handle time. You want to make sure that you welcome that early tenure customer in a way that doesn't create another callback quickly, right? So customers are looking at, you know, ways to change their mindset around that. Um, I will say that one way to do that, um, you know, from a technology perspective, right? To your point, Brian, we're, you know, we're a cost, right? But if we put the right technology in place that helps our clients get to that proficiency faster, then that ROI becomes very apparent to our clients, you know, early on. So I'll give you an example. One way we do that is with training simulators, right? So our simulators are tools and technology that we've developed to assist the agent in understanding what that live contact environment is going to be like. Um, you can't drop an agent in the live contact environment, but what we do is emulate that environment, making that training a lot more impactful and effective. So when the agent enters that environment with, you know, customers, they're going to be more comfortable. They're going to be more versed on the specific subjects that the customers are wanting. And then we can even take those top call drivers or top contact drivers and develop training simulators around just those aspects of it. Um, so that agent's path to proficiency or their speed to green is sometimes we call it is much faster. And in the end, you know, the customer is much more, you know, much, much more pleased faster. The clients, you know, is, is pleased from a from an overall path to proficiency perspective. Um, I would say some other technology that drives the measurement and management of right uh, of the right KPIs includes coaching tools. So ours is called Inspire, but it, it provides agent with that immediate access to a coach or work at home huddles that provide virtual support. You know, our world has gone virtual, right? And so it provides agents with, you know, very fast virtual support. Um, another idea I would say would be gamification, right? We're using gamification in a way to engage the agents that help learning um, a lot more rewarding, a lot more fun, and um, it boosts their overall confidence. So when you incorporate all those types of tools and technology and you can get to a better overall result for our clients, then they don't look at us as a cost, right? They don't look at us as a cost play. In fact, um, if it drives an overall lower cost to serve, because that's really what we want to do for our clients and a higher you know, customer experience, then it's a win-win for both. So over the past year, we've seen something happen. All the stuff we were talking about, the need to be scalable, the need to be omni-channel, we suddenly saw how valuable it would have been if we were all actually doing it, when we suddenly couldn't answer the phone and we suddenly had to add seats for people working at home. And so that's given us a newfound appreciation for the idea of really being forward looking. And I don't think we wanna be fooled twice. I think everyone out there wants to make sure that they're getting ahead of the next trends. And so Saki, as we close here, what are some predictions and advice you have about the future of 
CX strategy, and then especially technology and outsourcing that you think are worth sharing today? Yeah, Brian, I wish if I had this superpower mm -hmm. to really predict and view future, right? Um, but one thing for sure I can say, you know, this having trusted outsourcing partners who can provide you the support operational uh, support operation expertise and also insights you need, like, you know, Jelly, Julie mentioned earlier, having proving effective for sure. And we need to invest in the future. So I say this literally because often customer service organizations are caught up with the day-to-day -day operations and the business because you know what's in front of them is really busy, right? Handling the calls or ticketing and, and anything like that. Rather than focusing on you know future about where you want to go towers or think about the capabilities you need to be built over time for that future. So um, making that space, the time and the mindset to focus on the future of CX strategy at the organization level is not an easy thing to do. The leadership has to be really investing in that time in your organization, but also you need a lot of allies and trusted partners to make this happen as effectively as possible. Yeah, Saki, I agree with you on the day-to-day -day management. In the BPO world, we tend to get measured on what happened 15 minutes ago, right? So it's hard to sometimes lift your head up and think about the future. But, you know, I, from a technology perspective, Brian, I think that we're going to continue to see changes um, on the desktop for agents, right? Because we're going to have more elegant solutions that are going to make servicing a variety of customer needs more seamless. Um, some of the AI solutions we discussed earlier, and I believe we're going to see more advances in technology um, that will support more of that virtual workforce. We see clients, you know, diligently kind of de-risking their 100% in-center model just based on our last 18 months. Um, and more work at home solutions are in play, um, including, you know, highly secure environments. So I think we're going to see a lot of, um, you know, continued involvement there. Um, you know, I will say, and I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, the other area of investment would be in the, you know, frontline employees, the frontline agent and engagement, because, you know, that makes a huge difference. And, you know, we're just big believers in investing in that agent engagement. Um, and it's not just about events at a site, right? It's not just about parties. It's not about those kind of monthly things that you see on a calendar on the wall in a call center, but it's really about engaging our agents and giving them tools that help their performance, right? Giving an environment that is an, an inspirational environment. So we have highly branded um, sites as, as Saki well knows. Um, and doing things that enrich their lives, right? Like leadership development, providing transportation, providing vaccines, arranging banking relationships so that they can purchase their first home. You know, that's that's really how we look at engagement. And I know that IBEX and uh, Netflix were strong believers in putting our frontline agents first um, and providing them with access to things that make their lives less stressful. So, you know, I look at technology, as we said, going full circle back to the beginning. It's an enabler, right? It's an enabler um, for a better outcome. And, um, you know, I think that we are, you know, continued investment in the frontline employees, con continued investment in that, in, um, in that making their jobs less stressful, giving them better tools is what we're going to see um, as well. So, you know, Brian, you made that last question for Saki and I, like one we could have filled the entire time slot with. But anyway, I think that, uh, you know, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think that we both, uh, we both see the importance of investing in our employees. Yeah, and I think if I recap everything both of you shared, and again, thanks so much to Saki and Netflix, as well as Julie and Ibex for your insights and your time today. But if I summarize everything, I think it gets to the idea of being better faster. So you think about from the front end technology, right? You're a consumer, you want to get better help or better support faster by virtue of self-service or smoother journeys or digital channels. If you're a new agent, you need to be able to answer complex questions faster by virtue of better training and better desktops. If you're trying to recognize that the standard for an agent needs to improve, you might want to hire better people 
fat and get them faster by virtue of use having more perks. Like you mentioned, better employee experiences, things that are going to put the right people in front of your organization. So in this environment where we're so fragmented and there's so many risks of falling out of alignment, if you can commit to unifying everything, your data, your technology, your partnerships, your people to be better, faster, you're going to create a better experience. And so again, thanks to our speakers here. Thanks to all of you. No time to answer the questions live, but we appreciate the ones we've seen. And of course, stay tuned as CCW Online continues. Thank you.